So salt flavors, it preserves, and it hinders. We cause the work of God to flourish, but we're also called to hinder the work of Satan in the earth. We have the kingdom of God, and we have the kingdom of Satan, and there is a clash right now going on, and we are called to flavor, to preserve, but also to hinder. I wanted to share something that I never thought I would preach on a Sunday morning, but because of the times in which we're living, I really felt led to do so. I'm, out, I'm actually going to teach on this. Was Jesus a socialist? Was Jesus a socialist? And there's a reason I'm teaching this. Because of what has been taught in our college campuses over the past few decades, there was a major shift towards socialism, especially among young people. According to one recent survey, 53% of Americans under 30 view socialism favorably, compared to about a third of Americans over 30. Similarly, a Gallup poll found that 69% Think about that. 69% of those under 30 say they would be willing to vote for a socialist presidential candidate. I'm not talking about voting or politics in that sense today. But when people begin quoting different things, they say the Bible teaches socialism. Jesus was a socialist. When that begins to happen and people do what they do based on what they believe the Bible teaches... As a Bible teacher, I feel we need to let our voice be heard. Many are espousing that Jesus was actually a socialist, that the Bible endorses that. Here's my question. Is that true? Also with that, um, let's find out what the Scripture says. Are those that push socialism rightly dividing the Word of God? As Bereans, what is God's heart on this particular subject? I know this, many are drawn to socialism because of the promise of free college education, free health care, etc. And let me tell you this from the outset. I'm not trying to tell you what to believe or what to do. But I am trying to share with, with you what the scripture says in this particular area. You realize this, first of all, nothing is free. You recognize that? Free health care, free nothing is free. And remember what John F. Kennedy said on January the 20th of 1961, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. How many of you know that thinking has changed over the last 50 plus years? Now let me define socialism. It can be defined as a system in which you have central planning of the economy by the government or government ownership of the means of production or the forcible redistribution of income by the government. So it can be one of three things or all of these. First of all, central planning of the economy by the government. Secondly, government ownership of the means of production. In other words, they can take over businesses and so forth. And then the forcible redistribution of income. Now, the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez, once said... Capitalism is the way of the devil and exploitation. If you really want to look at things through the eyes of Jesus Christ, who I think was the first socialist, only socialism can create a genuine society. And then he said this, Jesus is the greatest socialist in history. So my question is, is that true? Is that not true? Now, from the outset, I need to say something very, very important. Jesus did not come to give us a political system. He came to bring the kingdom of God. I want to say that again. He didn't come to bring a political system. He came to bring the kingdom. But some systems are much closer to the principles of the word of God than others. Now, there are many that say the book of Acts taught us socialism. If you look at Acts 2, 4, and 5, you'll see examples of that. And they'll quote various verses. So we want to look at those verses and rightly divide the word of God. Go with me to Acts chapter number 2 for just a moment, please. 
the book of Acts chapter 2, verses 44 and 45. This is right after the day of Pentecost. 3,000 believers came to Christ. God was moving in a powerful way. All of these new believers were now in Jerusalem. And here's what the scripture says. Verse 44, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So we see that the early believers were selling some property, some of their things. They were sharing the money, ministering to those that were in need. My question to you is, is this socialism? We'll talk about that in a moment. Acts 4 verse 33 says this. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great, God's great blessing was upon them all. I love this. There were no needy people among them. There were no needy people among them because those who owned lands or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now again, is this a picture of socialism? How do we interpret these two passages? Well, there are three important things we need to see. Number one, the early believers did not sell all of their possessions. I want to clarify that. They did not sell all of their possessions. The believers continued to live in homes and to meet in homes. Pastor Mark, how do we know that? Because the Bible says they met publicly and from house to house. So what is this talking about? It seems that they sold extra homes or property. Not the homes they were living in. Listen to me, private property was not abandoned. But God was moving. There were needs. So people began to be generous. They said, I've got an extra piece of ground. I've got an extra donkey I don't need. Let's sell those. Let's give to those in need. So number one, the early believers did not sell all of their possessions. Number two, their sharing was totally voluntary. Notice there was no mention of the state or the government at all. The Christians were not told what to give by a political leader. They gave freely, cheerfully, and voluntarily. Did you hear that? Freely, cheerfully, and voluntarily. So the believers were free to participate or to not participate. No one coerced them into selling their possessions or land or putting everything together to give to those in need. God was moving. It was a unique season, and they began to freely give. This is not an example of communism or socialism. It is an example of believers following the admonition of Paul in Galatians 2.10 to remember the poor. And that, my friends, we are all still called to do. Now, number three. Number two was their sharing was totally voluntary. And number three, this was not a permanent practice. It was a temporary measure. It was not permanent. This type of generous giving is to be a permanent norm. But the particular situation in Acts 2 through 5 was a temporary response to a particular need. Now this practice of having what the Bible says as all things in common was not taught or seen again in the rest of the book of Acts or in the epistles. These passages are not a command that all Christians should follow today other than the call to generosity. So we see this in Acts 2 through 5, but we never see it again. We don't see it in the church at Galatia or Ephesus or uh, Thessalonica or any place else. My pastor Bobby Andean said this, New believers were now facing a time of catastrophic persecution, and they were united in helping one another. Because they were being threatened by both the Romans and the Jews, Many chose to pull their possessions, 
property and finances because if they didn't own anything, the government couldn't take it away. And then he said this, the church at Jerusalem was the only church that operated in this manner. The only one. Having all things in common was only done for a season at the beginning because many believers had come into Jerusalem, they stayed for a season, and there was tremendous persecution in this hour. Now there's another phrase I want you to see from the Acts 4 passage, verses 34 and 35. None of them needed anything. Notice this phrase, from time to time people sold lands or houses and brought the money to the apostles. Notice where they did not give the money. It wasn't a tax. It wasn't given to the state. It wasn't given to the government. It was given to the church, the church leaders. So it was done not continually, but only from time to time. And it wasn't given to the government. It was given to the church leaders. One of my heroes in the faith is an amazing apostle by the name of Lester Sumrall. Most of you have heard of him. As a young man, he was mentored by Smith Wigglesworth and Howard Carter. And in his older years, in his 70s and 80s, God gave him an assignment, and it eventually became something that he called Feed the Hungry. And the Lord dealt with him to minister to the poor, especially his poor, those that knew the Lord around the world. In fact, when we were over with Pastor Solomon the last time that we were there in Uganda, there's a large, uh, a large truck, uh, how, what would you call it, a, just a trailer, and on the side, feed the hungry. That was Lester Summerall's ministry, and both he and Samaritan's Purse do so much to help those that are in Uganda. And here's one of the things the Lord told Dr. Summerall. He had an amazing visitation from heaven, and the Lord said this, when you do it, minister pastor to pastor. In other words, not government to government, but pastor to to pastor. For example, Pastor Solomon told me, even when the rice is given for free to help those in need in Uganda, the government taxes him $600 to get free rice to his people. Everything is taxed. You have to bribe or pay a tax or whatever. Nothing is simple because everyone wants a payoff. So the Lord said, give it pastor to pastor. Now here's the thing, if you know the pastor or the church is a ministry of integrity, you can trust them. In this last year, we gave money to Pastor Solomon in Uganda and two pastor friends in Nepal. One's name is DK and one is Purpu. I have been in all three of their homes. I have ate with them in their homes. I see how they live. I see the difference they make. A lot of times when you give to a charitable organization, they're taking 20, 30, 40, 50 percent or more just for administration costs. But when you give pastor to pastor, it can be 100 percent giving. It's going to the right hand. And so that's what they were doing. They gave it and laid it at the apostles' feet who then had deacons that helped minister that food in a responsible way with integrity. Now, there's another thing that is often popular right now, and that is that there should be sh shame or guilt if someone is blessed or prosperous. Listen to me closely. Is it wrong to be rich? Jesus did not hate wealth or the wealthy. In fact, the Bible says God made Abraham very rich. He blessed Jacob. He blessed Isaac. He blessed David. He blessed Solomon. But here's the thing. He did teach us that we should not be greedy or covetous. And really, you don't even need to have money to be greedy. People say, oh, the rich are greedy. The poor are greedy. If you don't know Jesus, everyone is greedy. We all want a piece of the pie, right? And so we're not to put our trust in riches. 
But there's been a shaming to say if you have something that's not fair, it needs to go to somebody else. But the reality is there's not just a limited source of income in the earth. And if one person has it, that means someone else can't have it. It doesn't work that way. Owning private property is not wrong. Both the Old and the New Testament affirm private property. Think about this. We can't even obey the commandments, the Ten Commandments, two of them. We cannot obey thou shalt not steal or thou shalt not covet unless we accept the notion of private property. Because if it's not yours, no one can steal it. If it's not yours, no one can lust after it. So the Bible teaches private property. And my people sometimes say, I, you know, that preacher, he has all this money. Let me just give you my opinion. If someone is blessed because of what they've done for the kingdom, that doesn't bother me. I would much rather have a man of God or a woman of God blessed than someone using it for ungodly purposes. We have a minister we know well, and uh, his name is Keith Moore. Wonderful man of God. Many of you know him. He went to our Bible school, taught at our Bible school as a great ministry. He went up to Victory up here in Cranberry to preach. They were in, in the throes of a huge building program. And he was there to preach and get an offering. He was so impressed with what God was doing there, he gave them a million dollars to help with the building. That's living to give. There's another woman that I know from my Bible school, and uh, she is in some of the islands. I might be America Samoa. I'm not positive about that, but all of these islands, her husband died about 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, and she continued the ministry, and she began planning Bible schools on all of these different islands. In fact, we supported her one time. She's doing a great work. Well, Keith went there. He was so impressed. He's given her a million dollars to plant what they're doing. Listen, it should be in the hands of God's people if it goes through them to the hands of other people. So we can't apologize if, in fact, God blesses us if we're blessed to be a blessing. Here's what Psalm 112 verse 3 says. Wealth and riches will be in his house. Now, this is a promise to those who fear the Lord. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness endures forever. So there's nothing wrong with wealth or riches or a house. Because God says, if you obey me, wealth and riches will be in his house. But here's what I found. The older I get, the less things mean to me. Has anyone found that to be? So you get older, you say, I've, I've got what I need. You know what? I just want to make a difference. I want to bless someone. I want to sow into someone's life. The older we get, the more we want to sow into the lives of others. Eight years ago, I was in France. Our family, my, my brother and son and some others, we went to see Normandy. And we were there and we were in France, which is beautiful. But they were talking about an increase of tax for the redistribution of wealth. And they said, we want to tax the very wealthy 80%. Which means that if someone provides a business and employs a lot of people and makes a lot of money, that if he gets, for example, $1,000, he keeps 200 and the government keeps 800 And so that was being pushed while we were there. So we were talking to some of the people, well, what's happening? They said, well, the wealthy are wealthy for a reason. They're all moving to Luxembourg because there they'll pay 50% tax. And so Obviously, their taxes are important. We need a balance in some of those things. But if we're not careful, we're going we're gonna to take from those that are really blessed and redistribute that. I don't see that in the scriptures. And here's the reality. I'm glad to give taxes, but when it comes to giving to others, I want to determine where my giving goes. Because they're probably not going to give to someone that preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're probably not going to give to someone that proclaims the goodness of God. So I want to make sure that I have a say-so in that. The government will seldom support biblically-based ministries that preach the gospel. Now, there's another parable, and we'll quickly mention this, that people say, well, Jesus taught these things. He wants equality and so forth. And, and listen, I have a great heart for the poor. 
I have been to 25 nations. I've been to India three times. I love India. I've been to Africa three or four times. I love the African nations. There's such need. We've built wells there. We're continuing to do things there. I have a great heart for the poor. But can I tell you who does it best? I believe the body of Christ does because there's no, there's no hidden agenda. There's no motive. We are just called to minister to those in need. But think about this. If the Bible taught socialism, this parable would not be accurate because remember the parable of the talents? One man had five, one man had two, one hand, man had one. The man with five and the man with two talents were faithful. They were uh, good with their resources. They uh, were blessed. And so they doubled them and the Lord praised them and said, Well done, good and faithful servant. But here's what it says about the man with one. The master told the man who was lazy and fearful and who did nothing with what was given to him, if you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you at least deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then he ordered, take the money from this servant, the one with one talent, and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. Now you think about that. Instead of saying to the one with ten bags, give some of yours to the one with one, he said, you were not faithful with the one, give it to the one with ten. Here's why. God honors faithfulness. God honors honors wisdom and ingenuity and creativity. Well done, good and faithful servant. And then Jesus said to those who use well what they're given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Not only is that not an endorsement of socialism, it is the exact opposite. Instead of a redistribution of wealth, the Bible honors hard work and teaches that individuals are responsible to support themselves. Let me just say something. I, again, have a great heart for those that are in need, but here's what Jesus said. You'll always have the poor with you. So no system will eradicate all poverty. Now, I know in the book of Acts and 4, there was no need, but that was for a season, for a limited time. But the reality is, Jesus said, you'll always have the poor with you. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do anything, not at all. But we're never going to erav eradicate all poverty or need through any system of government until Jesus Christ comes to reign in the millennium. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do what we can do. Absolutely, we should. But we need to understand there are some limitations. And let me just give you a little bit of my story. The first time I ever was in a communist country, I went through Bulgaria, Sofia, Bulgaria, on my way to Albania. I was in my late 20s at the time. Albania was the most communist country outside of China anywhere in the world. And when I got to Bulgaria, I began to realize, oh my goodness, uh, this is like going back 50, 75 years. They didn't have anything. Everything was dark. Everything was depressing. We were having a meal, and we, we were asking the waiter or the waitress, can you give us this, and you, can you give us that, and can you do that? And she just looked at us like, you stupid Americans. We don't have those things. And someone said, this is not America. This is communist Bulgaria. We, they don't have those things. And I began to see such great need. I love the people, but the system was very controlling and very confining. And then when I got into Albania, which was the most communist country in, in Europe, I began to realize it was like going back a hundred years. I mean, they had literally nothing. We gave them cans of, of food like ravioli and so forth. Ne they had never seen anything like that. They didn't know what a can opener. They knew nothing. It was like going back hundreds, if not many hundreds of years. And my heart began to ache to see this system and how it had failed the people. The intentions might have been good, but the reality was not good at all. About a year and a half ago, I spent a week or so in Cuba. Now, I've been to Bulgaria. I've been to Albania. I've been to the Ukraine twice. But really, when I was in Cuba, it is a fully socialist country. And I remember going to the house of one of the pastors. He was actually in his mid-80s at the time. 
and uh, the house was very plain. The streets were, were, there was trash everywhere, chickens, roosters, donkeys, and you name it. Just very, very poor, very few cars. And I heard this rushing of water. And I'm thinking, it almost sounds like there's water. And I turn around, and they're literally across the street from the ocean. And I thought to myself, if this was America, we would have had a Marriott, we would have had a Hilton, we would have had, you know, all sorts of things. But they, they, don't, they don't have anything. Their average salary is $20 a month. Not an hour, not a day, not a week, a month. And I looked and I saw this massive line of people and I said, what's that? Oh, that's the chicken line. I said, what do you mean the chicken line? Well, everyone's in line waiting to get a piece of chicken, or their chicken, not a piece, but their chicken for their family. And it just went forever. And I said, what happens uh, if they run out? They said, they often do. They just have to get in line the next day and hope to get it. I saw another line. Well, what's that line? That's the egg line. You wait for the government to give you your eggs. And again, they said sometimes they run out, sometimes they don't, but you give whatever the allotment is. They, they give you whatever they have at that time. And I remember talking to the pastor, who again was in his mid-80s, and he was talking through a, an interpreter to us, and he was telling Bob Buse and I, he said, we were such a prosperous nation back in the 50s uh, and so forth, and he said, I worked, I think it was a textile company, it was awesome, it was really, really neat to see. In the midst of all of that, he said, I um, was working for a company, and all of a sudden, Castro came in, socialism came in, and when he did, they changed everything, and they put people who had no knowledge of that government or, or that business in charge. And so he began to complain a little bit about it, and they said, you know what? Um, they called him aside and said, you, you can't say that anymore. He said, I'm just telling the truth. You have to have people that know the business to run the business. They said, not anymore. And I said, I have a right to speak up. He said, no, if you say that again, you're going to be taken away to prison. So he said, keep a low profile, keep your mouth shut, and you'll be okay. And uh, so he said, uh, full socialism came in overnight. They took over everything, and here's the reality. They said... In the midst of that, uh, everything tanked within three months. So they called some, uh, some economics experts in to say, can we turn this around? And they said, if you keep doing what you're doing, the answer is no. They said, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. So some 50-some-odd years later, it's still that way. And my heart aches because they're only, what, 90 minutes from uh, Miami? And you think of how Miami flourishes, and it's a beautiful island fully surrounded by the ocean. It's gorgeous. The people are precious, but the system has just destroyed the lives of so many. And here's the other concern I have when I see that, along with that always has to come a strong measure of control. And so they begin to cut off churches and freedoms and, and a lot of the things that we enjoy. And I realize there are different levels of these things. I'm not saying everything is Cuba, everything is Russia, everything is China. All I'm saying is, if someone believes that, that's their choice. But if someone believes that based on what the scripture teaches, that's not the reality. The Bible doesn't teach that.